Welcome to the 10th Living God's Future Now conversation hosted by Heart Edge. Heart Edge is an ecumenical movement for church renewal arising out of St. Martin the Fields in London, now on four continents globally, that believes renewal of the heart comes from the edge and seeks to catalyze kingdom communities through the four C's of commerce, culture, compassion and congregational life. Since last May, we've been running a continuous festival of theology and practice, of which this monthly second Thursday conversation is the flagship event. Please see the notices in the chat or on our website for how to get involved. Today, I'm absolutely delighted to welcome Sarah Coakley, priest, philosopher of religion, systematic theologian. Sarah has been professor of theology at the universities of Lancaster, Oxford, Harvard and Cambridge, and now resides in Northern Virginia and in semi-retirement teaches at the American Catholic University in Melbourne and Rome. Ordained in 2000, her work has long been grounded in, a twin, in the twin vocation of priest and theologian. She gave the Gifford Lectures at the University of Aberdeen in 2012. Sarah and I were in 2005 co-founders of the Little More Group, which has produced four volumes reflecting on church renewal uh, and grounded in priestly and congregational practices. It's a real honor to have her with us today. Do please put questions in the chat. I'll do my best to incorporate some of them as Sarah and I are talking. Sarah, you're in Northern Virginia, as I said, and um, I wonder if you could tell us about your experience of the pandemic uh, as, I guess, an English American and an American English person uh, finding yourself uh, at the heart of many things in, in America's life. Thank you, Sam, and what a delight and honor it is to be with you all um, this evening. Your question is a probing one, but I can't just talk about the pandemic because being in America in this time, living through January the 6th, um, living through the paroxysms of the last period of Trump's um, presidency has made it perfectly clear that whatever I say about the pandemic has got to be in, coiled together with the um, new understanding that I think we're all going through as white people of the way that the pandemic has been ripping the top of systemic racism in this country, one of the best and well-kept secrets of the contemporary world. And at the same time, one can't um, fail to notice that this mega crisis is drawing attention to all our difficulties in living together in this country and in the world. Underlyingly, of course, the threat of cosmological and uh, ecological disaster. But then all the economic and social and political structures, especially here in America, such a powerful country, which keep us from being able to perceive how these interrelate and also what we need to do about it and what we're able to do about it. I wanted to draw your listeners' attention to a film that I've watched three times now since this crisis began in America. It's a it's one of the best ways of getting into the structures of American racism. And it's, uh, it's by James Baldwin, the great, the great Afro-American writer who died rather young um, in the ages of, of cancer. Um, and the film is called I Am Not Your Negro. You can actually watch it on, um, on Netflix, surprisingly. You have to dig a bit. Um, and why I think it's so important is that it draws attention as only I think Baldwin can do to how America is structured on its racist past. And the film proceeds by first lamenting and reflecting on the assassinations of three of Baldwin's friends who are actually younger than him, Medgar Evers, um, Malcolm X, Martin Luther King. But it goes on from there to say that what Baldwin was really worried about was not, was not so much and only the fate of Afro-Americans in America, but the soul of America itself. And what he shows is that the, the narratives of hegemony, power, freedom, and unity 
not uh, perhaps uh, incidentally the watchwords of first Trump and now Biden in unity are as it were built on a systemic denial of what has to be set off as a binary against those. The miracle of uniting all these extraordinarily disparate people into one country under one flag, under one rule of life is that the underdog is becomes unseen. And he ends the, the whole film by saying, and it's his words I'm using, he said, if America didn't have the Negro, it would have to invent it. <laughs> um, and that the, 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 the challenge now, and it's not just a challenge in America, but it's a particular challenge in America to do the kind of inner work, the inner spiritual work that allows people to reflect afresh on how they are, as it were, implicated in political and economic conditions such as prevail in this country and which prevent black people even getting the vaccination now in the same way that white people can get it. Hmm. That's a short starter for 10. <laughs> yeah, could you talk about how that, how you witness those kinds of hmm. dynamics, uh, you know, either in, either in the academy or in, in just uh, being a, a citizen? I think it's easy to miss them in the academy. Um, and it's not in the academy that I've been so easily able to see them um, because since the civil rights movement in the late 60s, most universities and especially great universities such as the ones I've been lucky enough to serve have made at least very um, obvious um, attempts to include under scholarship people who otherwise might be disadvantaged. But in a place like Harvard, where I taught for 15 years, this actually distracts one from what is going on just down the road <laughs> in Boston, which astonishingly is a city which has a very little opportunities for black people to become middle class. So all the middle class black people are in all the universities in Boston on their scholarship, you might say. But it wasn't until I served in a jail as I was training for, for ministry that I was able to see my own whiteness problem through the lens of mass incarceration, which has now, I think, become better known through the work of people like Michelle Alexander, who have pointed out since then, since 2010, when her book, The New Jim Crow was published, that actually, you know, all the promises of the civil rights movement were in effect shut down under the rubric of the war on crime, because the war on crime was, was actually a war on the black civilian. And this was when um, the intensification of, the yet greater intensification of police brutality and frisking um, in black areas of cities really came to a climax, but this was done under a kind of liberal mandate of um, seeking out the drug dealers, um, which many black people, of course, approved of. Oh. So no. I think in the, in the, in, in the academy, uh, you know, you have to probe in the church, alas, also, the history of the white church in America is that it has often been used, it's used its prayer and its worship as a means of a further bulwark. <laughs> in the systemic maintenance of racism. Um, and the number of genuinely interracial congregations in DC, for instance, um, uh, in the Episcopal church is tiny. I've been lucky to serve one in the last year and that's been enormously stretching and interesting for me. Hmm. Now, I mean, you're, you're a person who um, is, uh, is, is known for your ability to engage great narratives. Uh, you've, uh, particularly in your Gifford lectures and in, in other writings more recently, you've, you've taken on, you know, some of the biggest narratives of all, uh, Darwin, for example, in terms of re-narrating evolution. And it'd be, be wonderful if you could say a bit more about that as we, as we go along. But I mean, the, you've already spoken and you've already touched in in one perhaps two narratives 
uh, by by speaking about the the official version of American history, for example, and a, and a and a rather different and more challenging version of American history that's closer to the truth. Uh, could you say about uh, talk talk some more about how these these sweeping narratives uh, affect both the pandemic and and the race conversation? Yes, well. If I may, I, I will have a stab at this enormous question of, of evolution, because um, we've been living through a number of decades um, in which an evolutionary narrative as put forward by some leading scientists has argued that the story that evolution delivers to us as humans is one in which selfishness and competitiveness um, is the only successful undertaking, if you like. And this is actually a very remarkable phenomenon, which people take for granted in a way, because it's been so well pervaded by excellent um, science writers, that it's difficult to peel away the, um, as it were, metaphysic and ethic that has become entangled with the actual scientific investigation. It's become stuck to it, so that it's become very difficult to say, well, wait a minute, is that what Darwin said? Is it what he meant? And is all the new information we now have from the genome actually, which of course is the great novum that, 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 that Darwin couldn't have anticipated, is that really the only way of interpreting what's happening evolutionarily? Um, and I don't think it's a coincidence at all to wave in another mega narrative that in the same period, we have experienced uh, across the globe um, a form of neoliberal economics, um, a, a particular form of capitalism. I'm not an anti-capitalist. What I'm against is the, is the forms that capitalism had taken since approximately 1980, where I think looking back, we can see that this was the moment when um, the economies of developed Western countries cease to be closely connected to the gross nat nat national product and became forms of, as it were, banking betting. <laughs> and this, of course, this was aided and abetted by the new developments in the computerization of, of, of um, economic um, and banking life. And I think the most interesting thing about this is that if you look at the story that the evolutionary theorists were telling us at this time, and you look at the story that the economists were telling us at this time, they have curiously um, parallel developments. Um, in fact, there was a moment in the middle of the Enron scandal when the person on, in the dock um, actually justified his um, nefarious behaviors by reference to the selfish gene, as if um, that story of anthropology, as it were, was indeed the, um, as it were, justifying fundament of a particular way of behaving in the economic markets and, and, um, and in business. So how do we throw a new light on all this? Um, this seems to me to be the great challenge at the moment because how we think about evolution and how we think about our economy in relation to politics, because so much politics now has become economics. <laughs> that's another development that's occurred in this time. This, of course, is deeply entangled with the stories of COVID um, and the stories of racism with which I started. This is, a, this is a big picture which all thinking people and certainly all thinking Christians ought to be concerned about. And my own work for my Gifford lectures arose, just to speak very briefly about this, from a really fascinating in-depth three years that I spent with a mathematical evolutionary biologist in the last period of my time at Harvard in which we were looking at how the new investigation of the evolutionary phenomenon of cooperation through mathematical methods has really questioned some of that selfish gene ideology at its base. It's not that evolutionary biologists now say uh, there is no competitiveness, no viciousness, no nature red in tooth and claw in evolution, uh, um, of course there is, but that has always been counterbalanced by another factor in evolution that we're now beginning to understand. The, the factor that, as it were, um, countervails for that by um, 
evolutionary populations having forms of cooperation, which is meant in a rather technical sense, not just as collaboration, but as um, uh, activities which are sacrificial, if you like, for the sake of the whole population. So some part of the population loses genetically, but the outcome is that the whole population gains. Um, this is particularly exciting, as you probably know, in the realm of ants and bees. In, um, in, in the realm of, um, uh, of animals, um, meerkats are supreme cooperators. They're probably even better than humans. Chimpanzees are pretty good. Whales and dolphins are amazing. Um, and once we begin to understand more deeply how these factors balance one another, and either make for the flourishing of communities and populations or for their gradual decline. This raises really fascinating questions for ethics and indeed for theology. And that's, that's what my Giffords are about. If we're hardwired for cooperation, <laughs> what in order to flourish, in order to flourish together, what does that mean when we come back to think again about Jesus' teaching in the Sermon on the Mount, for instance. Um, this is very fascinating stuff. I think it's still not generally known out there in the public world because as with any scientific paradigm shift, uh, scientists hold on to their old paradigm very ferociously um, before they're willing to, to give it up. Uh, not just scientists, I think. Uh, I mean, I think we're all <laughs> we're all a bit like that. But, but uh, so uh, there's a couple of directions I'd like to take this. Obviously, I, I'd love to hear you say, you know, more more in detail uh, about uh, what you described as as cooperation, but not collaboration. Mm -hmm. um, but but I wonder if we could start by digging into this by by looking at the pandemic again mm -hmm. and at. at because the economic imperative, mm. uh, there's been this profound economic imperative, we've got to get back to work, we've got to function as an economy. Um, there's also been the public health imperative, which is, you know, stay at home, shut the door, uh, throw away the key for three or four months. So oh, that certainly seems to be the UK situation right now. Um, then there's what you might call a kind of psychosocial imperative saying, you know, you can't, you can't do this to five-year-old children. They're missing out on seven months of crucial socialization. Mm -hmm. They'll never get it back. That, that, that kind of, let alone the, the, the mental well-being of all of us. Um, I wonder if you could talk about those insight, you know, that, 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 that the, your insights about neoliberalism and the, yes, yes. you know, the sort of, um, valorization of competition as hardwired into our DNA and therefore to be government to encourage and foster circumstances for it as opposed to mitigate it in any way. Um, could you could you explore that a little bit? Yes, further? Well, Maybe we'll talk about the broad sweep, uh, you know, evolution theological themes in a, in a moment. Sure. I mean, the first thing I think that has to be asked is on what economic theory are you basing the presumption that Everybody has to risk their lives to get out there and keep working. Um, because, you know, there might be other alternatives, um, such as reconceiving how we work together, which we've already done to a significant extent. Um, prioritizing the safety in terms of the use of the vaccine for those people who necessarily are risking their lives because otherwise they can't put bread on the table. Or we we who don't have to go out um, can't live without their sacrificial behaviors. This is where the cooperation thing really bites, okay? So we need a bigger paradigm to look at the apparent straightforward um, clash of medical safety on the one hand and economic expansion on the other. And I don't hear many people providing that paradigm. It would involve a shift to the left um, in most countries, because if the highest priority was to protect and sustain people and to make sure that they were able to eat and, um, and that the, the vaccine was disseminated in a way that was genuinely democratic, or indeed favoring those who most needed to look after others, um, that's not really happening in the United States, as you may have heard. Um, my husband went to get his first vaccine last week and I, when he came back, I said, just tell me, how many non-white people were in the queue? And he said, funny you should ask that. 
I only saw about two. It was better when I went two days ago, I'm glad to say. But there's been a lot of fuss about that in the Washington Post. Um, and some states are better than others because the, the Republican states are just allowing the vaccine in some ways to be distributed again as another form of um, selfish gene ideology. You know, the most sophisticated people with the best form of um, ability to investigate where the vaccine is available are the ones who will get the vaccine. Possibly the so, biggest donors to the Republican Party. <laughs> yes. Um, so there's nothing apolitical about this crisis, all right? <laughs> um, and uh, another, another writer whom I'd like, really like to commend to your audience at the moment, who's been um, really helping me at this time, um, is David Marquand. Um, who um, is an economic historian and a few years ago wrote a book called Mammon's Kingdom, <clears throat> which is about Britain after the 2008 crash. And again, he made a point which I think virtually nobody made at the time, that in 1929 there was a crash and the world changed its economic views. <laughs> there was the New Deal, there was Keynesianism, and people recovered. And there was a lot of protectionism in the development of economies afterwards, which is what aided the recovery. After the 2008 crash, business as usual. Everyone was meant to just look the other way. Um, the bankers who had brought this upon us were um, in some cases berated and lost their jobs, but in other cases just carried on. The, the, the state just had to take the, take the cut we all did, in fact. Um, but there was no real renegotiation of the economic status quo. And this is what is so remarkable. And we've got time now to think about this. We're all stuck at home. This might be one of the reasons why we can best use our time. <laughs> hmm. So um, I, I wonder if you could then broaden that uh, so that we can explore together a little bit more the, the theological and ethical uh, ramifications of uh, of these these new relatively new insights uh, about evolution sure um do you want me to talk culturally generally or do you want me to come onto the church at this point uh, no no um, let's keep it broad for now and we'll we'll, okay. we'll we'll um we'll we'll draw maybe draw it into the church in, in a little right. while right well of course it broad. As an academic, I, I have a vested interest in um, in a kind of the, the, the dissemination of information, the the creation of um, new ways of thinking that might um, uh, help us to uh, make some prophetic turns. And so, I think what we need is people who are able to write in um, an extraordinary classic way across disciplines. One of the problems, of course, in the contemporary academic life, and indeed in political life, is that we don't have the necessary detailed knowledge of all the disciplines that we need to bring to the table at the moment to solve this particular crisis. But um, at the mega um, evolutionary scale, um, there are things to be learnt at the moment about what it is that we have done as humans to affect ecology and um, animal populations and their moves because of um, global warming that some people think have created the conditions under which this virus um, jumped out of, um, out of various animal species into the human. Um, we then have to look at how this virus has been disseminated and of course this is extremely closely related to the way that we travel nowadays and the amount of communication that we have um, across countries and therefore the ease with which this particular pandemic has been spread compared historically and it's very informative to look as a historian at how previous plagues and previous pandemics have both been started and spread and also how they've been stopped. Um, so we need the evolutionary um, virology perspectives. Um, but then we need the, the political perspectives because unless we collaborate, 
and even cooperate sacrificially with others um, in the um, sharing of information about, about medical um, ameliorations of the disease itself and vaccinations and so on, which, by the way, I think we are doing quite unexpectedly well. Um, <clears throat> this is the bright side of the story. Um, then, uh, th then we're also stuck. And I think this, this presents us with one of the biggest problems for contemporary democracies, for those of us who are lucky enough to have modern democracies, and that is you can't make major changes that affect long-term human behaviors in relation to pandemics and, and ecology in the space of a very short four-year government, all right? So this is a real crisis of Western democracy because it's never in the interests of a prime minister who doesn't have a very large majority to start doing um, making demands um, in relation to taxes or emissions or whatever that will make it difficult for him or her to stay in power. So we come up against what we came up against after the First World War and the Second World War that we need inter, inter um, national uh, forms of communication and the power in them to make changes without which we're going to we're going to founder. In fact, we have to create to go back to the story about cooperation and its human forms, <clears throat> we have to create or extend the use of our amazing international forms, new forms of communication to face this crisis together. Oh. Um, and I think this is the biggest moral challenge that the human race has ever faced. When you say forms of communication, say a bit more about what you mean by that. Well, I mean, if you think about it, um, when the United Nations was formed, there, were, there was no internet. Um, um, we can now communicate with each other um, and not just at the level of the higher elites um, in ways that we've never been able to do. And this has all happened in, in my lifetime. When I gave my Gifford lectures and I ended on a rather sort of depressing note about how difficult it was politically for anyone even who understood the importance of cooperation to make it work. Several young men who came to the Gifford Lectures who were scientists and not Christians, and I was delighted that they, that they came, they got back to me afterwards and they said, well, look, we actually do have the technical means of communication to do this. The question is, how do we form the political alliances across governments, whether they be democratic or not? One of the great ironies here, of course, is that it's some of the non-democratic governments that are doing much better at facing this disease than we are, precisely because they're communists. <laughs> uh, that's not an argument for being communist, but it does tell you something about how um, uh, emergency responses to something like the pandemic um, can be easier in more authoritarian circumstances. No, they're not all communist, I think it's fair to say, is it? but they are all authoritarian. Well, not all of them are. I mean, uh, New Zealand and Australia aren't authoritarian. Um, no. um, but they're, they, they've made a decision to, uh, to be isolationist. Um, um, and uh, by the way, it, it's often pointed out that, that some of the best leaders, probably the best leaders in our world in responding to the pandemic have all been women. I think this is quite significant. Mutti in Germany. <laughs> The extraordinary prime minister of, of new zealand um, can i just pause you for a second uh, because claire's raised the point about um the the assumption of economics which has been largely unquestioned until the ecological issue has become so overwhelming um that that the economy simply expand Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, could could you reflect on that? Because Claire's sort of you know raised that as a as a as a significant challenge. I think and, that's and that's a key question. Uh, what does what does that mean? And and do say more about what you mean about that you know this this greatest challenge in terms of communication. Uh, I yes, there's two slightly of, different two points. Yeah. I mean, I'm not an econ economist, and um, um, it's actually an area in which I'm now starting to read very intensively because I feel that anyone who doesn't read intens intensively in economics um, <clears throat> is likely to have the wool pulled over their eyes um, by, our, by our politicians. So I'm a beginner, and Claire may not be, but 
I think that's what, Claire, I think that you're exactly right. What we need to be asking is what are our fundamental assumptions in economic theory? And how would we justify them? And what are the alternatives? And there are alternatives. Um, um, and um, <clears throat> Marquin, for instance, is very strongly in favor to returning to a more Keynesian set of presumptions. Um, I was preparing for this, this session and thinking about, this is to segue a bit into the church, but I was thinking about William Temple and his extraordinary uh, prophetic work, um, both after the First World War and then on into the Second World War during which he died. And um, his, his great book, very short book, Penguin book, uh, Christianity and Social Order. He wasn't ashamed to be a member of the Labour Party. He wasn't ashamed to be a friend of Keynes. Um, he set out a vision for our country, which I, I think our, our religious leaders are afraid to do, um, whether for fear of loss of personnel and support, um, or whether just for lack of information. But it's these big questions about economics that I think churches like St. Martin's in the Fields, which set such a prophetic bar, frankly, in the United Kingdom, should be enabling. I think it's our duty. I wonder if you could expand. I mean, it's sometimes said that economics is the new theology. Mm. Uh, I wonder if you could, for the, for the sake of the people on the call, uh, it, you know, explain what what a sentence like that means to you uh, in... <laughs> well there's one thing it could mean which i would not agree to at all which is that theology itself um has become um as it were um entranced and um, stupefied by the reduction of politics to economics but uh, no um, that but it, wasn't in sense that, in which but that's it. the inverse in, of what yeah. you wanted to say yeah but i think um what I'm increasingly learning is that political theology and economic theology is what's needed at this time, because what's needed is the reimagination of a culture that is truly and deeply Christian, that, that obeys the commands of Jesus's difficult teachings. And that means sharing. And sharing is not um, popular at the moment. <laughs> it's not you know, mandated culturally. What's mandated culturally, both by the evolutionary story we've been told and the economic story, is that you strive to the top for your own. Um, and if it means pushing other people downstairs, that is the, as it were, necessary outcome. To, to what extent do you think that is related to the diminishment of emphasis on everlasting life? The, the, mm -hmm. the, in other words, the, 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 the kind of the urgency and the, uh, the need to replace what would have been the benefits that, that people looked forward to, according to Orthodox Christianity, uh, you know, through the forgiveness of sins and the life everlasting, have now all got to be realized in this life. So suddenly it's a it's like the, the chocolate game that I used to play as a child when you used to roll a six and put on all your, your gloves and your hat, your hat and your scarf and then eat as much chocolate off a metal plate as you could <laughs> till someone else rolled a six. And then you had to take all those off and they put it on and stuffed all the chocolate in their mouth, even if they didn't like the paper, because it prevented other people getting it. I mean, is that a kind of view that well, there won't be cake at the end of the party, so you'd better take all the chocolate now? Unfortunately, I think that the, the eschatological... Um, card can be also used in both directions all right alas because you know it could be used to justify serfdom in you know czarist <laughs> um uh, russia because the peasants would get their reward after death so um we don't talk enough about eschatology either um but if it's simply um uh if it's sort of a, a, def a deferral um, of something that you're not getting now, that's a debasement of eschatology. But also if it's erased and all we have is now, then we don't have hope. And hope is an absolutely key Christian. So um, that... could you say, I mean, could it, so, so I'd like to see if you, if you would connect hope and the collaboration theme. 
Mm -hmm. if those two go together because it seems to me they're both about a sense of something more profound uh, than simply what we can grab for ourselves in a limited time they, they seem to both yeah. be a statement of faith in something beyond that it is i mean i thank you for making that connection which i don't think i make sufficiently in my gifted lectures but i think it is absolutely integral to what i'm trying to argue there because if science delivers a vision, as I believe it's capable of now, of forms of intentional sacrificial behavior for the sake of the whole, which can be seen in retrospect to actually have flavored the entire development of evolution from bacteria up, if, that, what, if that's what science can deliver, it's the theology that has to deliver what goes with it, all right, which is that the, the ultimate motivation and sustenance and graced capacity to not only collaborate with that vision, but to further it mm -hmm. um, comes from our faith. And our faith and our hope and our love hang together. The greatest, of course, is love. But without hope and faith, love can seem thin but but i mean william going back to william temple he mm. he you know christianity and social order that's about hope that's about a mm. land fit for heroes to live in that's about saying that after the war mm. you know once in a sense the old society has reached its nadir mm. we we this is the kind of society we want to build from from the ashes exactly. that's, that's about hope and collaboration together, together. Or, or as we would say at heart edge living god's future now i mean that that's exactly. that's the eschatological the, the 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 end times the heavenly vision brought into the present the present which is the oh. structure of the kingdom yes exactly so now let's talk about the church then in terms of yeah. you you've been um critical of, of the fact that um not enough theological voices and obviously that means the church and the academy uh, have been able to give this more holistic vision uh, to recognize how deeply imbued in our culture mm. what one might loosely call Christian values still are. And, and Tom Holland has made that point eloquently mm. in his Dominion book, which is uh, another mm. one I've put on in the chat for people if people want mm. convincing of that point because he makes it brilliantly. Um, but um, could could you say perhaps you know you've you as you said yourself you you've been profoundly shaped by your experience in local churches mm. on both sides of the of the atlantic uh, and heart edge is obviously committed to the renewal of churches like that could could you locate some of that in church practices and sure i mean many many people in our culture including of course christians are suffering very deeply through this pandemic both as a result of their own health and grief over lost ones, and also through the widespread mental health issues that the anxiety that this state of affairs creates in us. But that notwithstanding, this time that we're having in kind of enforced retreat, I like to turn it around and think of it as an enforced and lengthy retreat, a kind of um, uh, lengthy period in the wilderness in which I think we're being asked to do some very deep inner work and all of us um, Christians can show the way here and the church ought to be guiding this um, and this inner work is not narcissistic or el elitist it's the work that we all ought to be doing at Christians all the time but now we have the opportunity and the time to do it and it's prophetic inner work um, Again, go back to the great crises of the Second World War and think of people like Bonhoeffer, think of Gandhi fighting for independence in India. Um, what they saw, and which I think our contemporary church finds it very difficult to understand, is that the deeper the inner work, the profounder the political ramifications. It's not a choice. Um, unfortunately, we've created a lot of spirituality, which is really about sort of narcissism and self-development, but it's not about facing these big questions we've been discussing. So point number one is, I think the church has a prophetic role here in calling people to reconsider what church is in terms of uncomfortable, discomforting, 
interruption by the spirit <laughs> into a new way of thinking about ourselves as community and our relationship to the world. That's point number one. Point number two follows from that, of course, that I think the church then has out of that wellspring of newly developed repentance and transformation comes the prophetic voice. Um, and I think the church is by and large letting us down in that its leaders are mainly concerned about loss of finance for the churches, whether churches will have to close, um, whether how much panic is caused by the fact that people can't meet together at the moment and can't hug each other and therefore can't reassure each other. Um, I take all that and it is very disturbing. It's part of the discomfiture. But if that is what's concentrated on and not what the outcome of all this could be, then not only are we losing our moment, <laughs> but we're losing our sense of what it means to be followers of Jesus. Yes, so so uh, uh, there's a couple of um, ticklish are, uh, uh, um, issues at the back of this, which you know, one of which could draw you into some controversy, which of course I'm keen to do. Um, <laughs> but I'll tell you what they both are, and I, I wonder if you could respond mm -hmm. to both of them. So one is uh, uh, what tends to come up in debates about economics, about ecology, about um, the, the, the church and its under, and its role in society is a sort of nostalgia as a time yeah. that a sense that we actually got it right usually at an undefined time in the past um but and i wonder if you could talk a little bit about mm -hmm. that but then the other issue which has been raised i think by victoria in the chat here is is a sense that uh, the church has has been profoundly influenced shall we say i think Victoria's word is seduced, but I, I'll mm. say profoundly influenced uh, by notions of growth, measurement, and competition mm. uh, in in ways that uh, some would say uh, distort the gospel. Uh, uh, so those are both somehow tucked at the back of this conversation. I wonder if you could yeah. briefly reflect on both yeah. of those. Yeah, um, I think. Behind both of those is the prevailing anxiety that has gripped the church in these last years. Um, and as Rowan Williams constantly reminds us, you never do anything really positive out of anxiety. <laughs> um, and so um, I don't mind being, um, being controversial here. Um, I'm not suggesting in any way that the church succumb in England, in, in Britain, to what Episcopalianism in America has tended to succumb to in the past, which is the sort of reduction of churchliness into political liberalism. Um, quite, I'm, I'm the most conservative person um, you could imagine um, liturgically in some ways. And I hope it's not out of nostalgia. I think what, what it's out of is this strong sensibility that unless our gathering together to worship really evokes the transcendent and not only the great comfort of the transcendent, but the challenge of the transcendent, then we're no better off than anyone else in tackling um, key political questions. In fact, we may be worse off because we're using the church to protect us and cocoon ourselves against the realities. And that's what, that's what white Christianity has done classically in sustaining racism in America. It's used church, it's used prayer, it's used Eucharist for those purposes. Um, the one that's more close to home for Victoria's question, I don't mind being controversial about either. This is Victoria Johnson, by the way. She, oh, uh, right, okay. <laughs> Hello, Vicky. Like um, <laughs> because, um, I think I already have bad press at, 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 uh, at, at Lambeth for, um, you know, having views about this, that um, if, if, our, if our main concern is the number of bodies that cross the threshold, as opposed to the extent to which we are growing spiritually <laughs> um, in maybe discomforting ways, <laughs> um, then we again have lost the plot. That doesn't mean that we should fall back into 
a well-known kind of um, uh, wallowing in hopelessness, which I think was really quite popular um, in Anglicanism. Um, I think Bill Vanson had a lot to do with it. It wasn't his fault, but I think people used him in that, um, yeah. Yeah. that quest for a while. Yeah. <laughs> um, and by the way, I'm not sneering about um, evangelical expansion, quite the opposite. Uh, <laughs> that's exactly what we need. But the question is, how, how do we... Um, how do we combine really strong apologetics and evangelical expansion and training and formation in the Christian faith with this strong sensibility that we have responsibilities as Christians to grow, that, um, that we do not use the church as a buffer against our own growth, which is always seductive. And that's the right word to use. <laughs> So, so could you, I mean, could you, we haven't talked about the Bible very much today, mm -hmm. and, and, and I wonder if you could point us to, uh, to, you know, places in the scriptures that, mm -hmm. that you feel speak particularly or have been forgotten and neglected, perhaps, mm -hmm. both about the pandemic, but also about, you know, this larger conversation, which is, well, which is a conversation about political theology, really, and, mm -hmm. and, and what what we understand the church to mean as a body uh, and as a body in a society. Could, mm -hmm. could you reflect, because I mean, I suppose the, the, the comfort uh, sort of uh, way of approaching this is to go straight to Romans 13 and to say, you know, there's a, there's a clear spiritual life of the church and that is best exercised by keeping out of the um out, out of the the public political sphere and, and and also cultivating these this sort of personal ethics which of course the religious right has manipulated in the states but 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 you know if you could offer us perhaps a, a richer a richer vision than that <laughs> well very briefly i would say three particular loci in the new testament rather obvious in a way but to return again and again and again to to the Sermon on the Mount um, and to the more discomforting and impossible demands of it. <laughs> Jesus, Jesus asked us to do impossible things, at least six impossible things before breakfast. In fact, <laughs> there are six impossible things he asked us to do in the Sermon on the Mount. And reflecting on what that might mean in the life of grace and sanctification, I think, does and should continue to discomfort us along with his remarkable parables about money. It is so astonishing that so many of his sayings and parables are about money. So few are about sex. <laughs> and each one of them has a really strange punchline that you're not expecting. Um, the most peculiar being the dishonest steward. But that's where I think a lot of our new reflection again should be in Jesus's teaching. Secondly, Paul, what Paul gives us, of course, uh, along with perhaps the unfortunate elements of his accommodation to the life world, the political life world of his time, and we know how that was used by German Lutherans in the 30s, but what he also gives us is his extraordinary vision in Romans of a, of a cosmos which is yearning towards completion through the suffering and death and, and resurrection of Christ, and that we can only access this through the really very disconcerting interruption of the Holy Spirit in prayer. Um, and so that's actually, if you think about it, it's the, the one great passage in the New Testament that's about ecology. It's about our being bound in Christ, not just to each other in the church, but to all creatures, as we now know we are. And along with that, of course, we get also in Romans, the great vision of the body of Christ, in which we are all interdependent, that we are, uh, we, we rely on one another. This is the great sort of vision of cooperation. Um, um, that also comes with sacrificial cost. And the third place I would go would actually be the Johannine literature. And I, during these last months, in as a result of saying my morning office and, and going after Christmas to the, to to one John, um, very, very interesting material there on how sin blinds us. You can link this to the man born blind in John's gospel. And I, I'm just so aware about how the 
how sin is connected with perceptual distortion. And our incapacity to see what's right in front of our noses is a feature of sin. So one of the very strong things I, I want to say, and I'm writing on at the moment in my second volume of Systematics, is that we need to think again about sin. We need to think very seriously about how it disables us, what it is, a matter on which the Christian church has never had any unanimous view. Um, what are its outcomes? Um, and how Christ's death and resurrection and the giving of the spirit are the means of its progressive undoing in grace. Um, what do we have to offer here to a, a world that is so lacking in perception of how it's killing itself off, frankly, by its blindness? Now, um, there's a hobby horse of mine that I think would probably be a hobby horse of yours too, so I'm going to share it now. Uh, and that is this uh, this description. It's a government. It's a government description that churches may be open for something called private prayer. <laughs> and 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 it's a conversation I have with my colleagues about. I don't. I don't like. I don't want us to use this phrase. Uh, and and you know you know where I'm going with this. Uh, mm -hmm. th that what you've described i remember reading one of the first theological books i read uh, when i was beginning in this journey in the early 80s uh, by tom cullinan called the passion of political love mm. and and I, i'm sure it's not still in print but uh but it was the first time i'd been introduced to the notion of prayer as being a political act mm. okay. you know at, at the moment when a christian says who who really is boss and who really actually isn't Mm. boss you know and, ha and and how that moment when a christian uh allows the the fullness of true reality to uh suffuse the shallowness of apparent reality mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I wonder if you could say because i know mm -hmm. how important this is to you personally uh, mm -hmm. in terms of your practice of contemplative prayer uh, and obviously, you know how at the Nazareth community at St. Martin's, it's become fundamental to our understanding of church at St. Martin the Fields and through our Nazareth companions, uh, likewise. Uh, I wonder if you could say a little bit more uh, about sure. about the, the significance of prayer in terms of realigning our whole imaginations. Well, I know why you're reacting to the government, um, because that phrase you know, you may go in for private prayer is both, of course, motivated by the dangers of the of the pandemic, but it's also suggesting a, a, a kind of well known current cultural presumption that private prayer is sort of navel gazing and it's self. comfort. It's yeah. this this comfort narrative that you yeah. disclose very beautifully. Or even if it's discomforting, it's discomforting in the same way that, say, psychoanalysis is discomforting. Yeah. It's for the expansion of my psyche. Mm. But um, but I'm not going to I'm not going to I'm not going to turn around. This is paradoxical. I'm not going to turn around and say down with private prayer because think of Lancelot Andrews, right? Precarious privata. Mm. Think of the requirement on all priests and indeed laity to to say their prayers. Um, ostensibly privately. <laughs> but I think one of the th great things about the adventure of silent prayer in particular, but of all prayer, when it goes to any depth, when you allow it to go to any depth, is that when you start in on this great adventure, it seems terribly lonely. And down, down you go, and all this crap inside you jumps up and hits you in the face, and you think, I'm I'm alone. I'm 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 in great danger. Um, my world is shaking. But the further down you go, the more you see that this is the least private thing that you do, <laughs> even though you do it by yourself. It's what actually links you at the profoundest levels to each other, but with a transformed consciousness and a transformed set of priorities and goals. And that's why. The kind of community that you're now founding um, and have founded so successfully with Richard Carter at, at, um, at St. Martin's is, is a marvelous model of uh, that other churches should emulate, in my view. Um, I mean, Cullinan was a remarkable Benedictine who's now died, um, alas, but, but, he, 
but he had to leave Ampleforth and go and do his own thing because he was worried that the way it was being done at Ampleforth was not, uh, as it were, um, according to what Jesus asks of us. Um, likewise, I think the great interest in the last decades in centering prayer and other forms of, um, uh, of, of contemplative or silent prayer have the capacity to go either way. They can become clubs. Um, uh, they can become forms of um, uh, interest in one's inner life at the cost of the outer life. Um, but when they work well, um, there is fallout. And there's inner fallout and then there's outer fallout. Um, uh, there will be trouble. There will be trouble. If you pray seriously, <laughs> there'll be inner trouble and there will be outer trouble. And only the fruits of this are the, the way of testing, as it were, um, whether this outcome is finally of God. So one last question, if I may, Sarah. Uh, Heart Edge is in many ways, well, I'll just explain what I mean by what I'm about to say. Heart Edge has two founding principles. One, that, that, that Israel was closer to God in exile mm. than it ever was in the promised land. And that's mm. the experience out of which the Bible came to be written. And so we can expect our times of adversity to be similarly mm. generative. And the second is that God gives us everything we need. Mm. Our, our eyes need to be open or we need to be, our perceptions need to be sharpened to, to recognize the forms in which God is, is sending us, every, which the church has been mm. historically slow to do. Mm. Um, in 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 some ways, and we've said to each other this as a as a as a as a staff team uh, uh, running Heart Edge that uh, that in many ways it, Heart Edge is really about a renewal of our understanding of the Holy Spirit. Mm. Mm -hmm. that, that both of these insights are are really about expanding uh, our notion of the Holy Spirit from from what can be quite a limited notion of. of uh, albeit making Christ present, but often very much associated with larger than life human experiences um, to to a, a sense of how God is at work in, in the world and how God, how the Holy Spirit makes Christ mm -hmm. present in 10,000 places. Uh, mm -hmm. could, could you could you respond to that? Because it's come up a couple of times in the chat mm -hmm. and it's integral to how we understand what we're doing at Heart Edge. I'm delighted you raised this. I, as you probably know, my own theology has been accused of not having perhaps a sophist sufficiently sophisticated theology of grace and different types of grace. But it is characterized by a very strong emphasis on pneumatology, on the doctrine of the spirit. And nothing could have delighted me more than the Journal of Pentecostal Studies wanting to have a, an issue <laughs> interrelating with me about what I was doing. So. I don't think there's ever any genuine renewal in the church without a renewal of reflection on the Holy Spirit. Um, and it's worth remembering that the uh, translation of the word parakletos as comforter is really quite, um, this has come up more than once, it's really quite misleading because what it really means is one called in to help, <laughs> who does indeed comfort. Does comfort, well, particularly but, but misleading also, in America, where a comforter means, means a duvet. <laughs> yes. Um, I think, you know, if I have a last word for you is, if we're discomforted in the church at the moment, that's a good sign. Mm. We're all discomforted. And um, the question is, what, what are we being asked to do in, in, in response to that? Um, and not only in terms of our own growth, but in terms of give, giving hope to the desperations of the world and the future of the ecology, which after all is the most dangerous crisis that we are facing, even despite these other ones. Uh, we have reached um, the end of our time, which is a, a, a great, um... A great pity because, uh, I, well, as always with you, Sarah, it's a privilege to spend time with you and and uh, to learn what you've just been reading, which is always puts what I've just been reading to shame. Um, the 
uh, I should say a few words before thanking you, which is to thank people for joining us, to say there are many, many ways to get involved in Heart Edge. We've spoken about the Nazareth community, which is a big part of our life now at St Martin the Fields and is uh, extended through Heart Edge also. Um, there are many things that have been put in the chat about upcoming events. Uh, I can also let you know that uh, this second Thursday conversation, our flagship, flagship conversation within Living God's Future Now, next month on the same day of the month, uh, March the 11th, will be with Jonathan Tran, who's Associate Professor of Theology at Baylor University in Waco and uh, has written about race, you know, very extensively, mm -hmm. and um, including a, a large book soon to come out, a very large book indeed. Um, so do uh, do tune in for that. Uh, but uh, before closing, I want to say, Sarah, um, what you've given us tonight, I think, is a is a wonderfully holistic kingdom vision uh, of of that stretches the imagination of the church, not simply to be what, in rather narrow terms, is usually thought of as the church, but mm -hmm. but to be a truly king kingdom vision that encompasses. Our imagination encompasses the narratives that pervade our our society that encompasses the most pressing issues of the day race and ecology and the pandemic um and i think you you say that you ended the gifford lectures on a slightly downbeat note but i think you've you've embodied precisely that you know the one word that i think is is central to theology today which is hope so thank you for uh, for doing so in such a an elegant and um, uh, and thrilling way. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sam. Um, it's been such an honour uh, and um, and a pleasure to be with you all. And I've while you've been doing your peroration, I've been flicking through the the names at the top and mm. want to send my greetings to several old friends. And um, sure. also will enjoy looking at the questions that were raised. Um, clearly, you have a very engaged group. And um, I wish every blessing on the extraordinary things that are being done at St. Martin's in the Fields this, at this time, because frankly, it's an inspiration to all of us. Thank you, Sam. Thank you very much indeed. And thanks to everyone for joining us. Bye.